it's, it's really a blessing to uh, come up and be able to share. It's also something I never take lightly because the Bible says when you teach that you incur a harsher judgment. <laughs> I read that for a long time in Bible college. I was thinking, man, I'm not sure I want to do this thing. <laughs> I have to rely on mercy a lot. <laughs> I didn't come from a very good place. I came from a Christian family, but I was the one out of a big, we had eight kids in my family. I was the one they thought never get saved. <laughs> so I thank God that he came and he costed me. I love that when I think about getting saved, um, we've seen pretty radical salvation down here last Saturday night. And and because uh, I'm an evangelist, I get to go around and I see a lot of people saved. And it, it never gets, un it's never not beautiful because it's the most beautiful thing you'll see. When you see God just accost someone and take their heart and take the heaviness off them and see new life and their eyes start shining like the headlights were turned on. And they're just like, wow, that never gets old. It never gets old. The angels, they, they're just in awe because angels don't get saved. And it says they love to sit there and they see that. Like, wow, oh, my goodness. Whew. So I like to really remember when I got saved and when I had that feeling. And when I wanted to run out in the streets and tell everyone about Jesus Christ. Whew. I tell you, after we've been saved a while, we need to keep remembering that. Because we really have two jobs after we get saved. <laughs> One is to understand that. <laughs> That was like the draft. After we got saved, we were enlisted in God's army. And the other deal is to see who, where we fit and what we're supposed to be doing. And see who God made us to really be. Because when we do what God made us to be, that very inside deal, that's what, there's a feeling about doing that that never ends. And it sets you free and, and it does something inside you, the very depths of your soul, when you do what God created you to do and he releases you. I said, I mean, most of my ministries that are the best, I stumbled right into because <laughs> God left me, led me that way so that it could happen. And I've seen some pretty incredible things. Um, and learning that he has your back. I do a lot of crazy places. People say, why do you go do the, some of the ministries you do? And I say, well, when I go fishing, I like to go to places that has lots of fish. God sends me to places where they have like up to a million people, and most of them need saved. That's a big fishing hole. So you want to go, and, and you get to meet people and go along. And, and as we train up in God, see, one of, the, one of the things God was really working some stuff in me. And one of the things he was, was working in me for a while, and then Pastor Dave called. I knew God was putting a message inside me, and Pastor Dave calls me up and says, Hey, Ron, when we're out of town, do you think you could preach? I'm like, yeah, I've been waiting for this call. <laughs> This guy says, you got this message to release. So I don't want to come with stale bread. We don't want to be feeding stale bread. We want fed fresh bread. You know when the oven turns on and you're smelling that cooking? Oh, man, I remember my mom used to break all this bread. And you start smelling that. And, and man, you could eat a whole loaf when you were a little kid like that. Just that smell. And when you finally got to go eat it when it cooled, oh, my goodness. That butter melting all over it. And I want that kind of fresh bread. I want to be that hungry for Jesus. I want to be that hungry when I open up this word that's full of his bread and just eat it like that. Where it just, I don't want stale stuff. I want something fresh. Last night we were talking about that. And one of the ushers went out back. I love our ushers. We, we got awesome ushers here. I thank, I thank God for them. And he said, I went back out to start watching the crossing out there. And when I went back out, it, the smell of fresh bread was all over outside. <laughs> See, there's a sweet smell to the Holy Ghost. <laughs> and, and it was drawn him. That word got out there and he could smell it all around him. And so I'm telling you, there's, there's just some incredible things you can see in God. And I don't want to forget that, that what God does there and how he takes care of us and how he leads us. I'm afraid too many times we do because, you know, it was God's kindness. It talks about it in Romans 2, verse 4. It's his kindness that led us to repentance. You know, when I used to read this, I thought it was a, a book of, of rules that I couldn't follow. <laughs> Trying my hardest and it just beat me up like a bat was whacking me. <laughs> and then one day I got accosted by God and the Holy Ghost. And this book turned into a love letter that was written to me. And when this book turns into a love letter written to you, 
you're going to enjoy it even more. And then found out after a while, I was the one because I beat myself up. God said, put the bat down. Quit hitting yourself. Got a little bit of inner healing. And the inner healing dropped the bats. Someone in Isaiah 61, that's what they're going to be teaching you. Stuff inside you that makes you keep beating yourself up. It's what you get. See, it says life and death are in the tongue. So if you're speaking good over you, the words of God come out of here and get on you. Good. Or if you're speaking bad, that gets on you because your, your voice puts stuff out. God spoke this world into existence. Whew. You know, when you get saved, it says you become a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.19 talks about that. Galatians 2.20 about becoming a new life in Christ. But I have this friend he teaches in the Hebrew a lot better than I teach Hebrew and, and the Greek. And, and he was showing me a deal in this teaching a while back. I got to listen to him. And, and he was showing that when you're a new creation, that word, there's the word sometimes, you know, they don't always translate good. And he was showing me that what that really means is not that you're a new creation, but you're a new species, basically, it's saying. Never one like you before. A complete new species. There's never been one like you, and there won't be one like you. God gave us individual fingerprints. He gave you individual DNA that's not like any other person. And when he created you, and you come born again, you become a new species. You're lucky that a bunch of college professors don't change you around and, and fight over who gets to claim the new species. <laughs> Because you become a new species in Jesus. And you have, a, you have a job then. The job is, will you stay full of the love of Jesus and let him fill you even more? Will you find the Holy Spirit? I'm telling you, there's 10 or 12 or 20 times in life where you get encounters by God so deeply, your insides are changed tremendously. Whew, them encounters are beautiful. When you get saved, you have one of them kind of encounters with the love of Jesus Christ coming and just wiping you out. And so we want to see encounters of God go. And we want to see that new creation. But when you're made a new creation and the old dies and the new starts living, then it's Christ living in you. And it should look different. One of the things I was sitting at home one day and I was thinking about why we come to church. Do you come to church to be, to be entertained. We got a great worship band, but their, their heart is not that you get entertained. Their heart is it opens up heaven and you get encountered. They don't show up and do what they do for that. They show up so that we can be encountered by God. So do you want to come to church to be encountered and, or do you want to be, come to church to be entertained? Do you want to come to church to be entertained or do you want to come to church to be equipped? Equipped to go out and do the things God's calling you to do. Because each one of us has a different spot in God's army. Everybody has a different, a different job, but they all work together. If we're going to take this territory for Jesus Christ, we're going to have to work like an army together. I was, I was seeing this deal where I, I, I ran into this story about a guy back in, in uh, World War II, and he was a cook. But this cook got a medal of honor, the highest medal you could get. Because this cook, there was a group of German soldiers that were, they, they spoke English really well, and they would, wear, they would wear American uniforms, and they were going in like they were just one of them and then wiping out whole areas. And they're wiping out whole, whole, all these Americans, and they were, they were just this killer squad that was released. And they went and they wiped out this whole group of people, Americans, that were fighting there, and the only one that got away was a cook. He was wounded, and he crawled into this, this trailer there pulling full of food and released the dogs to go sniff around. They couldn't smell them because of the food in that truck. I just thought, that's just the food they're after. And he got out, and he took out that unit that had been killing lots of people. And see, if you're in the army of God, I don't care if you're a cook. I don't care what you do. You're an important job. See, everyone in there, that, even if you're a cook, you're trained to battle. So first we come to church because it's a hospital to fill people and heal them up. 
And once you're healed up, then you're turned in. Then you become part of that army that goes out. See, we're supposed to come in to get filled up and counter God, a fresh thing to go out with it. And see, after you're in the, if, you're in the, if you're in an army for a while and you do good, they move you up. But it doesn't matter where you start. I tell you what, we have great greeters. When you come to the back, there's always a smile back there. I love that. No matter where you go, you'll see that. There's so, so many people, it's every part of a job. If, if I didn't have sound people up there, bless the sound people. And the TV people, they're up there to do the sound so you can hear. So that the worship goes out more. But they aren't just up there for excellence. They're all a part of it. They're all a part of this army. And when you go out and we've won battles for our country, they don't go and say, well, John Smith was the one. He won this war. No, they say, we won the war. That's America. And for God, as his army, we go out. Whew. We had a servant king that came here to serve us. He so deserved more than what he got. And he came and laid down his life for us so he can live inside of us. Whew. So, and everyone's called. You know that. Ephesians 2.10 says that everyone's called to good deeds in Christ that he wants to do through you. And you can do all things through Christ in his strength. Ephesians 4.13. Lots of other places. It talks about God's strength going through you and God doing it. You don't have to do it in yourself. We have to do it in him and through him. It says in Ephesians 3.20 that we can do more than we can even imagine according to his, basically it says, according to his work and his power that is within us. So when we're in that army, we got to look around and see. See, when, when Jewish kids are born, they don't name them. They didn't used to name them right away. They waited and seen their character, and they called forth. They named them based on their character. Now, when, when you're good, like a, a Jewish, Jewish parents, it's really funny. You ask a Jewish mother, you say, how old are your children? She said, oh, the, the doctor, he's five, and the lawyer over there, he's three. They start calling forth destiny that they see. See, when I got saved, I was pretty wild, and, and I met these people. I said, come to Jesus. He'll make everything wonderful. I mean, they made him sound like Superman and Santa Claus and Easter Bunny and all these good things at once. Going to come forth, and everything's just going to be wonderful and change overnight. And I found out, literally, at first, I was like, what? What do you mean? That? But then I found out. See, Jesus Christ was better than anything they were saying because they were talking to faith. See, Jesus starts showing us if we'll get right with him, he'll start showing us how to see what's inside people. We won't look at the mess they're in. We'll look at what's inside them and we'll start calling that forth. We'll start calling that forth. We'll see who Jesus made them to be. See, he gives us eyes to see way better than seeing through a wall. He gives us eyes to see through the junk in someone and call forth the goodness out of them. Call forth who they were called to be so they fit that place and are delivered. Whew. He was a lot better than that. He's the one that showed up in the room when I was dead in a morgue in a body bag and blew life back into me. He's the one that came forth. He was so much better than anything. Where I've seen him deliver people, heal people. and whew. That's our kind of God. He's a great leader. Come humbly and fill us up full of great things. You know, a lot of people come to church, they want to ask what the church can do for them. And that's good for a season. When that season's over, then you ask, now what can I do for Jesus? I'm going to go to church so I can be equipped to go out and do something for Jesus where we can take this area for Jesus Christ. Well, they say, wow, what's going on over there in that Yuba Duba area? Whew. That the world wants to show up and see what's going on here. We win as a whole army working together where even the cooks can do battle. Where the smile at the back door hits someone so hard in the spirit, it changes who they are. <clears throat> See, when we call forth, 
I love my, my wife says, I'm going to go have this date with my dad. I know she's going to go off and spend some time with Jesus. And I love that. I love not because we're having problems, because I love what I see in her when she comes back after she spent time with her dad. And I love, I go away, spend time with my dad. And I love what happens. Those times are incredible. So when you start finding out who you are in Jesus, whew, you find them times by reading the word. You find that by spending time alone with Jesus and letting him speak to you deep inside. And he starts taking this away. He starts, it's funny, it says, the Satan wants to come and he wants to have you stand in front of the mirror and play search and destroy on yourself. Oh, yeah, I don't like that. Oh, no, I don't like this over here. No, I, I don't like that. How could and Jesus wants to say, no, nope, you're fearfully and wonderfully made. He wants to change how you see yourself. He wants, to, he wants to change how you talk about yourself. See, there's an extraordinary God who moves through ordinary people, but they're not ordinary people after Jesus shows up. Mordecai, they were building a, a gallow to hang him on. That was a season. That was a season. Instead, his enemy got hanged, and he got moved into the palace. So his season, maybe you're going through a hard season. Maybe your eyes don't work very good. Paul's, the apostle Paul, he had to be blinded so he could see. There was a season. Then he went to write a lot of the New Testament because of what he did. Elisha, when his servant, his servant was freaked out because the, there was an army coming in. More came and more came. And he's going, man, he sees this big chariots and all these armies coming after him. And he's like, why aren't you freaked out? <laughs> That's what his servant's saying. Don't you see this? And Elisha said, Open his eyes so he can see what I see, God. What do you see? Whew, I see fiery chariots and angels and more that are here. Whew. My prayer is we get good eyes for Jesus. Whew. Our church has a motto. <laughs> Find a need and meet it. Whew. But I, my motto, go deeper for now. Find what Jesus really created for you and fill that spot. Let him fill you from the inside. The peace that comes in Jesus. He said he's the prince of peace. You want to learn about peace? Go straight to the author, the prince of peace. <laughs> let, him, let him be peace inside you. Because you'll never find real peace till he goes in there. Find strength. I was telling last night, twice, because the stuff I do for in motorcycle ministries, twice they've sent hitmen for me. <laughs> and the hitmen got saved. Long story more than I got down here. <laughs> because God held one time, this monster of a man down, he held him down until I prophesied to him. And finally, he slides off this couch. He came there to kill me, slid down, and is weeping in front of the couch and repenting for all he's done in his life because of the Spirit of God. We got that kind of God. That kind of God that loves you. And it's not for a few people. We can't even call ourselves ordinary anymore. Because God wants to take us from the outside to the inside in a palace to eat his food for real. He wants to show us that we are really king's kids. And so there might be a season where you're going through this and you're going through that. And there's so many people in the Bible, they had a season. Ruth had a season <laughs> where she was gleaning just a little bit that was left after the pickers went through. And after that season, she owned the fields. So maybe you feel like that. Maybe you feel like you're a nobody. <laughs> That's the very people Jesus is looking for. Jesus took, a, he, he took through David. David went out to the, the cities of refuge. That's where you couldn't be. You went there because you couldn't be in a regular area. They wanted to arrest you. <laughs> you couldn't be there because you're the down and trodden of the world. And they went with David and with God. And they become mighty men and women of valor. Whew. What's written about them is incredible. It says that David, he killed Goliath when everyone was freaked out. Why did he do that? Because he seen God way bigger than he seen that giant. So maybe your problems look huge today. 
And maybe God needs to let you see that he's way bigger than that just by changing how you see. That's the kind of God we got. The God that wants to show you the answers because God is the answer. I don't care what the question is. I remember once in street ministry, <laughs> I had this young guy with me and, and I, was, I was praying. I, I, I said, hey, can you pray with me? There's a, some deals going on in this inner city in a really dangerous area. And, and this big guy's up there and, and he's kind of, you know, he's doing some stuff. And so I said, let's just pray about that and see what we're supposed to do. And he jumps out and he runs over to this big guy. And this big guy's thinking, he's not really, man, he's a baby. And he's about ready to get punched at this big guy. And I'm thinking he's going to knock his head off and it's going to roll for a few blocks down the road. <laughs> and so I run over and I said, I said, wait, 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 Jesus is the answer. That's the only thing I could think of. And this guy has me up in the air with one hand. He's going, Jesus is the answer. And this car comes, he runs over and slams me into the car and tells the people, get out of there. They stopped to help me. <laughs> they took off. And he's holding me in the air, and all I could say is, Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the answer, Jesus is the answer. Because <laughs> I know Jesus is the answer. That's the only thing I knew. <laughs> and after a while, he puts me down. He goes, if Jesus is the answer, I ain't et in three days. What are you going to do about that? I said, I'll be happy to go buy you dinner. So I went to the restaurant and set the guy down and set this boy down that's with me and I was thinking, what, what am I going to do? Because Jesus is the answer. I said, man, I don't have no money with me. I don't have my credit card with me. I said, I tell you what, you stay here. I promise I'll be right back. I'm not going after the cops or something. And so I had to run down to an ATM in this bad area of town and get cash. And I want you to know, four people chased me back to that restaurant. <laughs> Thank goodness. I think that's why we have an exercise deal coming here because warriors should look like warriors and you better be in some training. You go to basic training, you have to get some stuff so you can go. And uh, I got back and a big guy was gone. And my friend said, see, when he realized you weren't going to the cops, you're going to the ATM. And he realized how he, how he treated you and he got tears in his eyes and he left. Now I went looking for him. I didn't find him. But I want him to know the grace of God loved him, and that's what I kept telling him all the way there. See, we're called to look for those that need rescue. We're called to be the answer. We don't always know the answer, but we know who the answer is. So we got to look to him. And some of you need to find out where you fit in that army. And, and if you feel like you just fit over here just a little bit and nothing, that's still important. You might get a medal of honor by God because he wants to use someone right there. How do you know that you aren't the next one? That one you think you're not going to save, they get saved and they're the next Billy Graham for this generation. How do you know that? We don't. We're not very good judges of what we're doing, but he is. And then when you're faithful and little, he moves you up. He moves you up into greater things. But I'm telling you, Jesus loves. He was a servant king, and he loves that servanthood. He's still going to go. When you're on God's armies, whew, um, one of the deals this message started to be named, Why You Need Four Crazy Friends. <laughs> and I'm going to explain to you why you need four crazy friends. <laughs> See, Jesus has been working on me hard about some things, and one of the dreams I had, and I'd have dreams and visions, and, and I seen this guy out of Luke 5, starts in verse 17, and it talked about this paralytic guy just laying on a mat. And he had four friends. And maybe you're called like this in the, in the army of God. And these four friends, they, they sat around there talking. And God made me hear them, either interpret the, the Hebrew for me, because they were all Hebrews, speaking Jewish guys, or he, he let me hear them in English. And I was hearing them, they're talking around. Look, remember our friend? We heard Jesus in town. That guy heals people, man. Let's go get him for Jesus. Let's go get our buddy and we'll carry him off that mat. We'll get him in front of Jesus. It's his day. Let's go. They all knew it was his day. So they got all fired up and they went over to the guy's house. And they see him laying there in the mat and they say, come on, let's go. And they tell him, we're taking you to Jesus. He's like, no, no, man, don't, don't be carrying me on. I don't like going like that. Can you just leave me here? Can you, can you please just, just, I'm just fine here. And they said, 
Oh, just be quiet. We're taking you. <laughs> we don't even have a vote in this. So they pick one, one on each side. I got four of them grabbing one of those poles on his little cot, and they're carrying them. And as they're carrying him, he's screaming, oh, man, this is uncomfortable. Be careful. You're going to drop me. And he's, he's just complaining the whole way. And they're like, just be quiet. They kept going. And then they get there. And the place is crowded. If you're not moved by the Spirit, you say, okay, we tried. Let's go home. Take them back. But they weren't. They were filled with the Spirit. So they said, no, we're just going to find a way. So then they went over and got some neighbor's ladder and talked him into it so they could put it up on the roof. And they're carrying this guy up. Then they went back and got some ropes. And they're taking this guy up by the cot. And he's screaming, you're going to kill me. See, I'm going to die now. Why did you bring me here? And he's screaming at him the whole way. And they just like, be quiet. And then they lift him up on that roof. And then they go over. And one of them was a prophet. You know why I know he's a prophet? They would borrowed a saw from a guy and they cut just in front of where Jesus was speaking through that roof. He knew where to go. He knew right where to cut. That guy on the mat screaming, wait, wait, I can't pay for the roof. What are you doing? I can't afford this. I can't even pay my bills now. And they're saying, just be quiet. And they cut the hole. Can you imagine Jesus, Sarah preaching and stuff's falling down through. He goes, don't worry about that. We'll deal with that later. I'm not through preaching yet. Just keep... <laughs> And he just kept speaking. And that stuff's falling down. And they cut a big enough hole in. There they are, letting them down with them ropes right in front of Jesus. And what happened? Their friend was healed. And he got up walking and took that mat out. And it changed his life. And Jesus is looking for four crazy friends that can go grab somebody. And you all need four crazy friends that when you're just feeling like doing nothing, they'll come and pick you up. And they'll come speak to your life. And they'll want the best for you. That's the kind of army God is looking for. I look through my Facebook. Everyone in there is crazy. <laughs> the crazy part's not hard. Some are crazy, crazy in love with Jesus. That's the one I want to come for me. And some are crazy because they don't have Jesus yet. And my heart is always that they do. So my, my prayer tonight and today is that... To, that God will change your eyes and you'll start seeing how to call. See, husbands and wives, I just want to pray the best for my wife always. And I, wanna, I just want to encourage what's in Jesus good for her. I remember when we were first married, one time I said, God, that woman you gave me. And I'm in prayer and I finally got quiet and the Lord said, well, she was fine, son. When I gave her to you, what did you do? <laughs> That's what God told me. See, when you don't like somebody, the reason you usually don't like them is something's undone in you. I go to God, hey, why do these people like that? He said, really? Why does that bug you? <laughs> and after, before it's done, <laughs> I had to learn to love that person because <laughs> the reason they were bugging me is something was wrong inside me. I need more healing. See, when we go set before Jesus, he takes our stone heart and he makes it flesh. And he takes the brokenness in our heart and he heals it. We, we, whatever we have in Jesus, there's always more. I love this friend of mine, this minister over in Sonora, he shared with, sharing with my wife and I, it's been a couple years back now about how that, the most productive times is steady because he's getting older, he's going, this is cool. I just found out your most productive times is your 70s and 80s. I was like, all right. Moses went it and he led the people of Israel across the desert when he was an old man and his older sister led the women in dancing. Moses was 80 when he started that trip. If Moses said his eyes didn't even go dim, if Moses could be like that, how much more in the New Testament do we have? How much more are we letting the devil beat us up and let us just fall apart because we're not standing for who we are? that new life that's regenerated inside of us because the very healer, the very prince of peace lives right inside of us. God is looking for people that will get his eyes still today. Whew. Isaiah 61, which Jesus wrote, read when he was in the temple, and it talks about cutting the captives free. <laughs> he said, you're seeing this happen today, and that very guy that wants to cut the captives free he wants to take the people and 
pour oil of joy over them that are sitting in ashes and miserable. He wants to take brokenheartedness and he wants to heal it. He wants to take loneliness and depression and break it off people. And he wants you to have his eyes even more. No matter who we are, we got further to go and more to see and more to come out. I'm so thankful for God's mercy and grace on me. But if at the end of the year I'm the same as I was before, then I've really wasted a year of my life. I want to be more like Jesus every year of my life until he takes me out of here. When I go out, <laughs> I always feel like God called me to be special forces the last 10 years or so, to go to places that were crazy to be in, where people would worry about me and have to pray. <laughs> but God was sending me there to keep me. And when you're where God wants you, he'll keep you to that place. When you hear God to go to a place, he'll keep you safe there. And he'll take care of you when you go there in him. And when I get to heaven, this is my prayer. That special forces, our SEAL guys, learn to shoot every weapon, including they try to train on the enemy's weapons. So if they take them over, they can shoot them with their own weapons. And I want to get to heaven. And I don't want to have one weapon there. Not one knife, not one bullet, not one bomb, not one missile that I had to shoot at the enemy that's still in my care. I want to get there because I have nothing left to shoot and it's my time to go home. And my heart is that you'll see what's inside you, the battle weapons you have. Some are in worship, some are in prayers, some are that's the most powerful thing you have. Whew. And my prayer is you see just who you are and where you fit because together we take the world. When this infection's gone, they're getting all worried about this infection. <laughs> I think about a great minister of old said, go ahead and put that AIDS on my hand, and it died in his hands. See, we got the healer inside us. We need to quit being so worried about this disease and that disease and let the healer rise up inside of us. My hope is to see, I've seen thousands of healings now. I've got to pray and see thousands of healings. I've seen legs grow back out that were shot off for 30, 40 years, just show up. Little arms grow out. I've seen people raised from the dead. Well, my favorite one was in Children's Hospital with this little girl that was just turning three and she had died and they just declared her dead and I got to go in and pray and she just sat up and said, I'm really hungry. I had to see, pray for a boy I haven't met, but I prayed for him and he was electrocuted like me, fell 40 foot, no hope to live. And I got to pray for him because a neighbor of the lady where he got hurt, hurt knew about me and called me up and I got to pray over this boy just over the phone, held over him. And a week later, he walked out of the hospital completely healed. See, I got to pay forward because who's been given much is owed much. You owe much. Whew. And it doesn't matter that I don't, I haven't met that boy that got healed. What matters is he knows Jesus Christ did it. See, when you don't take credit for healing and you know that he took the stripes and he died for you, then you don't have to take the blame. If it doesn't work, people say, what happened? I go, I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. Healing doesn't work because of me. <laughs> I might be a conduit at times, but it just flows through me. <laughs> You're going to have to ask him. Because I'm not in charge of healing, but he is. So, I, you know, it takes fresh faith each time, no matter what you've seen. It takes fresh faith. So my prayer is you go out here today with fresh faith, you go out of here with better eyes, and you go out of here knowing more who you are. And you have big encounters with the, the Father God and with Jesus Christ. I tell you, I'm in love with Jesus Christ. And I want to grow more and more in love with him because it's his love. If we go out without the love of Christ, then we got nothing. We are, we are, it says we're a gong, bang, 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 or clanging on a pedal. Uh, like a metal pan at people. But when we got the love of Jesus Christ, whew, my heart is you're filled more and more with the love of Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit takes your wine sack that's inside and puts oil over it and causes it to be up to four times as big as it is and pour more love into you. So much so that when you bounce into people, they get splashed with the love of Jesus. This world needs a lot more love and kindness. It's his kindness that came and got us. We didn't choose him. He chose us. I love 
the humbleness that came out. One story came out about Reinhardt Bunky and said, God, why did you choose me? He's asking him one day to come and do all this. He said, I didn't choose you. There was 10 before you. You were just the first one to say yes. <laughs> and God wants to say, do you want to be that one that says yes first? So I'm going to pray over you and dismiss, but if you want more prayer, then we'll ask whoever's here from the ministry team to come up, and we'd like to pray for you if that's what you want. But I just want to pray over everyone. Father God, I pray you'd pour out today. You'd pour out 10 crazy friends for each person in this room that really just want to see the best for them and want to see them go forward in Jesus and nudge them forward. I pray that your Holy Ghost would just come and fill people today. I pray your healing power would go forth because you, the healer, live inside people. Just let cut free and let those stripes be not in vain. I pray that you would bless each one to have new eyes to see you and new ears to hear in the spirit. That they'd start seeing who they were and the beautifulness of that. I pray that they would be blessed and the blessing that Jesus would, would be upon them. That they'd be blessed and blessed so abundantly they'd be blessed to be a blessing. We just want to thank you for what you do and who you are and for your mercy and grace that's been on our lives now. And we just bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.